Um, uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to present uh, our joint work on uh, joint work together with Harry Burman, Philip Bernanel, and Jordi Wegemans uh, on segmentation tests for quantum state identity problem. So actually, Jordi is also here at the conference, but I believe he is now might be at the session A. So uh, please don't hesitate to ask him questions about this work uh, during during. Okay, so yeah, so the basic uh, setup for this work, kind of it's all motivated uh, from the swap test. So the swap test is a very classical uh, primitive in quantum computing, uh, which basically uh, answers the question how we can compare two states. Um, so imagine that uh, we are given two quantum state psi 1 and psi 2. And uh, we are promised that they are either orthogonal or they are identical. Then uh, we know for a very long time from those fundamental works uh, that um, uh, if, if the input of two, if you have an input is to an identical state, then uh, the measurement probability of an answer that they are equal is 1. However, if they are orthogonal, then we only measure this with one half probability. And uh, the natural question to ask is uh, um, how actually optimal this, uh, this test is for this particular pr problem. And it was proven that it's actually an optimal test if, if we impose a, a perfect completeness requirement in, in, in this paper. And what does it mean, perfect completeness requirement? So uh, perfect completeness means that if we are promised, and uh, so if we are given an input with two equal states, then we are required to answer with 100% uh, probability correctly. So um, yes. Sorry, I'm a bit confused. Maybe I should start again. <laughs> because I assume people were, yeah, maybe we started too early. OK. Um, so um, yeah, so, so basically, the basic question is uh, to, to ask if we can generalize the swap test for um, arbitrary number of input states. So, and this is the, the question we want to, to study in all the details in this work. But of course, there was some work done before us. And um, yeah, and before I um, uh, describe the results of, of, of the previous work, let me introduce some terminology. So I'm going to distinguish Two types of errors I was usually done in statistics. So type one error was sometimes called false positive error, or sometimes called soundness error. Uh, is basically when we when we uh, given the the positive case we answer incorrectly, and the positive case for our state identity problem will be uh, that uh, all states are assumed to be identical. This is the positive case, and the type two error or called false negative or called completeness error, is basically an error when we are uh, given the negative case and then we answer incorrectly. So the negative case in, in, for this task will be that some of the states are actually orthogonal. Uh, and then uh, the figure of merit for us will be the, actually the average success probability. So given some prior that we are given uh, some either a positive case or, or a negative case, we want to calculate the success probability, like the average success probability of our protocol. Um, yes, and uh, we can um, also consider uh, even more requirement on, on the input in principle, right? So we, we can consider some more promise on the input, and uh, we can consider the average success probabilities with more prior, so to say, the input. In principle, we can also optimize such probabilities. Okay, so given this terminology, I'm uh, 
I'm ready to state precisely the problem we are formulating in this work. So the input for our problem is an unknown, um, is an unknown uh, Hewlett states, psi one up to psi n. And uh, so we are promised that they are pairwise orthogonal or identical. Uh, yeah, so this is like the first promise is that they're all identical, like the, the first case, which we want to distinguish from the second case. And the second case is a bit more tricky, so we want to be very precise what we mean uh, by non-identicalness. Uh, non so in one case, we assume that what we know is that only there exists some indices for which the states are pair uh, pairwise orthogonal. Uh, this is, so to say, maybe the most agnostic way to formulate this. Um, another, another case is when we are given some partition of the number n, um, uh, such that the input state, like the total input state, is of this tensor product form. Um, yeah, of the tensor product form like, like here. So we kind of don't know the basis, so we assume that we have some random unitary. Uh, but we know that among those n states, there are mu one states which, uh, yeah, which kind of equivalent to cat one and mu two states to cat two and so on and so forth. Right? So we kind of know the composition of our input. Uh, and here we crucially, so this tilde here means that we also uh, don't uh, assume any knowledge kind of on the permutation, right? So principles that can be given to us in the random order. Uh, and the finally, maybe the most uh, the most strongest kind of assumption uh, which we may have for, for this work is that we are given this input state in the tether product form, but we don't know the basis, but we, uh, we kind of know the order at which they are given to us, right? And so we, um, and we, in all of those three cases, we always assume that uh, the case one happens with probability p. And so this is like some kind of prior uh, probability which we can also adjust. And the task would be to to find the protocol, right, which given those assumptions return equal uh, in the if we are given the case one and unequal in the case two as often as possible. Okay. And so, so this brings me back to uh, to an earlier work uh, which. Uh, basically influenced uh, the most our current uh, work. So this uh, paper by Kada, Nishimura, and Yamakami from 2008. So what they basically proved, they, they generalized uh, the optimality result for the swap test. So they showed that a generalization of a swap test when we have now n qubit states actually is also optimal on the perfect completeness requirement. Right? So uh, again, the perfect completeness requirement here means that yeah, if we are, if we on the case when all those states are the same, our protocol should answer with 100% uh, probability correctly. And uh, yeah, so generalization of the swap test is kind of uh, very logical here. So it's called permutation test, meaning that, uh, so in the swap test, you remember we had like a qubit, right? And we controlled, we applied like a controlled swap operation. Um, and here it's basically the same. Now we have an ensemble register, but now we are planning to control over all possible permutations of over n systems, right? So the n factorial such permutations, and in principle, yeah, we would need the n factorial um, dimensional ancillary register here, meaning that we would need to use a QFT on n log n qubits here. Um, okay, and so. This uh, this work not only proved that um, the permutation test is optimal under perfect completeness requirement, they also considered um, uh, a different kind of uh, uh, tests, uh, namely one one very concrete example is a cy uh, is a cyclic uh, test or circle test, where instead of all permutations you apply only cyclic permutations, and what they also managed to prove is that it's actually optimal. Again, under perfect completeness requirement, but only for prime n, and uh, it achieves one over n error uh, for arbitrary n. And uh, so the reason to consider such a, a test is that now, like the circuit is much simpler, and uh, 
because we only have n permutations instead of n factorial permutations. Um, yeah, and so we need to use a quantum Fourier transform only on log n uh, qubits for in the ancillary register. Uh, there was another uh, paper, quite a recent one, where, which proposed another type of test, uh, which is interesting in, in the sense that it doesn't use any quantum Fourier transform, it only combines in smaller swap tests uh, in a such a circuit, which you see here. So you kind of, you assume that you have some kind of uh, uh, selected state, and then in principle, all the other states can be the same, and they prove the optimality in this very, rather very restrictive condition that it's actually, uh, yeah, uh, optimal uh, for arbitrary n, and very, only in this uh, uh, input case. And so this kind of naturally motivates the problem uh, following, following yeah, this work in 2008, uh, they already raised this question there. So what if what happens if one relaxes the perfect completeness requirement? Can we still prove some kind of optimality of a permutation test, or maybe we need to use another test? The first question. The second question, um, can one find um, uh, some, yes, some simpler approximations, so some other tests which uh, would be easier to implement and have lower complexity to implement? Yeah, for example, like, like in this paper in 2018, uh, which uses only subroutines of swap tests, smaller swap tests. Another question is actually to understand maybe broadly what is the underlying mathematical structure that um, allows to, to, to achieve um, near optimal performance for this simpler test, which, which is not of a permutation test type. And, um, Finally, um, what we can say actually about the performance of the test beyond worst case inputs, meaning that if you assume some, some additional assumptions on the input, maybe we know some, yeah, as I, as I showed earlier, we have this composition mu. Uh, if you know mu, can we actually say something about this uh, average success probability of our tests? Okay, so these are the questions which motivated our, our work. And Okay, the main takeaway maybe is, uh, for you is actually everything is fine. <laughs> Permutation test is optimal uh, without a perfect completeness requirement. Uh, well, th there is a fine print that uh, into slightly modifying permutation test uh, is, um, yeah, if we don't assume a perfect completeness requirement, there's a regime for, for the prior um, where actually an optimal thing would be to do the most stupid thing you can do is just output the same for each time. In the other case, it will be permutation. And uh, also kind of the second takeaway from our work is that we, uh, we use uh, a lot uh, representation theory and group theory to, to show a very general, uh, a general formula for performances of more general kind of tests, which yeah, which, uh, which, which is based on subgroups of symmetric. Okay, so this is like the main takeaway. And now I can describe in more detail our results. So uh, what, uh, what I just said in words, uh, yeah, there exists some optimal uh, probability, P star, such that, so this is this prior probability, such that, yeah, if we are above this uh, probability, then actually permutation test is optimal. For the if you want to maximize average success probability, and um, it, it it still achieves perfect completeness, uh, and it has a, a soundness error, uh, or as a like a soundness probability, which is given by this formula one minus one over the multinomial coefficient, uh, and uh, yeah, so and this probability has a very simple this p star probability has a very simple form, and yeah, on the other hand, if we uh, um, kind of have lower prior than the P star, then the actually the optimal thing to do is just always output on equal, which is kind of maybe not so surprising. Yeah, but now, yeah, we have this uh, uh, rigorously proven. Um, and yeah, in principle, uh, uh, we can compute an average case performance over any input distribution. Okay, what we can conclude from, from this result. Uh, so the first one is actually that in this sequence of these three different uh, um, quantum state identity problems, which I described in the beginning, the last one 
had uh, a lot of knowledge uh, in a way about the order of the systems. And it turns out that actually the order doesn't really allow to achieve high success probability. If you know this order, it doesn't really help you. Uh, the second thing we learned is that relaxing one side error requirement doesn't really increase the average success probability. And uh, yeah, the last thing is that the permutation test actually perform much better on most of the inputs um, than th those worst case instances. Uh, and those worst case instances have this one over n soundness error. But if, if you know this mu decomposition, then in principle you can improve this much, uh, you can improve this a lot. Um, yes, uh, and so yeah. uh, So this is the main conclusions from, from our theorem. So how do we prove this? Okay, so this is like the sketch. So what we need to do, um, uh, as I said in the beginning, we, uh, we assume our input uh, has the form like u to the tensor n times, uh, yeah, times some uh, uh, pure state written in a standard basis according to the decomposition, uh, to the composition mu. And uh, what we need to do, we need to average with respect to hard measure such a choice of the state. And uh, we will formulate the problem of finding the optimal measurement as an SDP, uh, yeah, as an SDP optimization. And so this will be a primal problem for us. Uh, the permutation test itself actually is just one example to this optimization problem. It's a feasible solution to this uh, primal problem with some objective value f, which we compute. And then we need to look at the dual problem. So it's just like a standard trick. Uh, we will look at the a dual problem will make some educated guess for the dual, and we will show that this uh, dual feasible guess um, uh, will have some objective value f star. So yeah, for that we would need to rely heavily on representation theory on Weingarten uh, calculus, but it's not so difficult calculation in the end. And um, what we will see, we will see that actually those two values are equal. So the weak uh, Duality will imply actually that the permutation test is optimal for, for the hard random, uh, for the hard random choice. Uh, well, and so there is very last uh, tricky thing is that we need to show actually that the hard measure is in fact the more like the hardest measure of all possible inputs. And uh, yeah, so we also need to do this step. And finally, this proves that if, uh, we prove our theorem kind of agnostically to the underlying measure. And so, uh, as I said uh, before, uh, we want to also to consider um, other tests, not uh, which do not use all the permutations of the symmetric group, or only only to focus on some subgroup. And in principle, we can consider arbitrary subgroup, and then the the G test measurement is basically a projector. Uh, so, like when we output equal in our protocol, yeah, this is a projector onto trivial Europe, onto this subgroup. G of symmetric group and unequal, it's it's a complement. And uh, we can just go and calculate, um, again, using representation theoretic uh, tools, uh, the formula uh, for the soundness uh, probability of, of, of the protocol is arbitrary group G. And uh, yeah, it turns out to, to involve such an expression where you can see, so K lambda sub mu is the Koska number, so it's a, um, Combinatorial, uh, combinatorial number, which is actually um, uh, quite difficult uh, to calculate and to deal with analytically, fortunately. And uh, the, the other ingredient is that what we need to know, we need actually to know the multiplicity of the trivial reducible representation of the group G uh, inside arbitrary uh, reducible representation lambda of the symmetric group. Yeah, so this is a classical restriction problem in the group theory, and uh, for some groups G, we can we can answer this yeah, rather easily. But for some, it will be a very hard problem. Principle, um, yeah. And just yeah. And again, the circuit still looks exactly the same as for permutation tests or for circle tests and so on. It's, instead, we will just need to use the Q of T of uh, of the size of number of elements in the group G, the ancillary register here. 
Yeah, as I said, some examples. So G, uh, if you consider the full group, this is just a mutation test. Pn is a cycle test. And what we thought uh, would be nice to do is to consider the following iterated cyclic press product subgroup. Oh, well, why? It's because of the prime number uh, position theorem. Um, we can write any number right in the prime factorization. And in principle, if you can understand um, how to restrict such, uh, how to restrict arbitrary irrep to trivial irrep of that group that give us a formula for the soundness uh, error shown in the previous slide. And, but for that work, uh, uh, this is very complicated uh, question in general. But and for this work, we assume that the number of states is a power of two. And in that case, it's just an iterated swap tree test. So it actually looks like a tree. So we just apply uh, like a bunch of swap tests in, in the tree manner. Uh, the, so this has like logarithmic and n depth, which is nice. And uh, um, it turns out that analyzing this test um, in and finding the formula for the soundness um, it's very difficult question, and what we were able to achieve so far is to lower bound this by some complicated recurrence uh, relation, which actually achieves the scaling one over n on the hardest input. So, in some sense, this is this performance of this test is the same as the permutation test on the worst case, uh, and it would be actually interesting to find whether this test um, gives some advantages uh, over the permutation test over wider class assumptions for the input states. Uh, but as I said, that would involve uh, understanding representation theory of this iterated uh, REST product uh, group um, to, 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 to a higher level, to a higher level. Okay, so, and what we can now say about some open directions, um, so here in our work, we didn't study the approximate version of quantum state identity. And so this would be the most natural thing to consider now if we can prove uh, the same optimality without one-sided uh, error restriction for the permutation test. Uh, yeah, as I said, we, it would be nice to analyze the G-test uh, further for the iterated, uh, iterated REST um, uh, subgroup, but also for find some other interesting groups which uh, uh, which would be interesting for certain inputs. Um, and uh, yeah, and the last question, can we actually use uh, similar techniques to reconstruct uh, this composition factor? So can we actually extract more information other than just saying they're equal or unequal with, uh, and, yeah, and prove optimality for, for such protocols using the similar techniques? So with that, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you for the talk. I'd be interested in your speculations about the approximate case that you mentioned in the end, because it seems like a very natural question. And I'm wondering whether you expect that the same kind of techniques apply, or is there something fundamentally different about the approximate version? Yes, so um, yeah, we thought about it. And uh, so we assume that, in principle, if we can think about, um, yeah, so if we model our input with some kind of mixed noisy noisy state, then I think we can uh, we expect our techniques would, would go through basically. Yeah. So with this kind of model, we believe it can be done. Yeah. About other models, I don't know. Okay. So then maybe I misunderstood what you mean by approximate version. So yeah. No, by approximate, I mean that um, uh, maybe um, like we assume that our uh, input state is some kind of mixed state, right? With uh, with high degree component, which satisfies the assumption, right? And and some small component which is, which doesn't satisfy the assumption. Yeah. yeah. If if you want to, yeah, assume some kind of norm closeness, uh, it's a bit tricky. So we we don't really, yeah, we're not sure.
Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, about a related uh, problem, or at least what I think might be related uh, with this like distillation of uh, mixed states, um, like many copies of a mixed state. I, I know that there was a paper that kind of showed uh, that this iterated swap test or something that looks like it is sort of optimal for um, for that problem. I don't know if you're familiar with that problem or if you think that they're similar or if you think that no, I personally haven't thought in that direction, so maybe okay. I, can, I can give a useful, useful comment. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, have you ever thought about what is the best uh, soundness you can achieve in the, uh, like a product test or swap test kind of thing? Like you wanted to accept with forty, like very close. I don't know. It's probably impossible to get it to accept with forty-one if if it's orthogonal. But and and then as the states get closer together, then you wanted to to accept with lower probability. Yes. Yeah, so, so so like what we want to assume here is um, yeah, basically. So our hope would be right if we know the so if we have this promise for mu right, uh, then yeah. So so this would be like the formula for the sounds. But because uh, you know those numbers are very difficult to deal with, it's very difficult to understand the scaling, symptotically. And so, but we would like to have that for certain choices of mu, uh, that like like some, some concrete choices of mu, this would scale you know, similarly as the permutation test, basically. So if you can prove that, that will basically mean that our easier tests is also good for that kind of input. Uh, but this easier test has lower complexity kind of in implementing, so it would be good uh, to use it in some context. That's kind of the way we are thinking. So was my interpretation correct? <laughs> I'm not sure like how so this I mean, uh, how that was related. So I mean I was more thinking about that if you have like you you don't care about perfect completeness anymore. you want to get the soundness as good as possible at the at the cost of the completeness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In some sense, yeah, we, we kind of be asking the question because yeah, we are maximizing in the end, we are maximizing the average success probability. But it turns out that this maximization of the average achieves the perfect completeness almost all the time, basically. Um, yeah, the the question we started from was, can we trade completeness for soundness in some sense? But it turns out to be not possible. That would be one of the outcomes actually of our result. Yeah, thank you. For nice talk, uh, like um, uh, uh, so for the soft test, um, uh, it is known that you can do the soft test without ancillary, right? So like um, I'm wondering if you can generalize this result for the G test. So like uh, for instance, if the G is in this specific form, you don't need the ancillary to, you know, perform this kind of thing. Or uh, uh, have you thought about that? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it's possible. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, but it's a good question. Uh, definitely worth thinking about. Yeah, I don't have a quick uh, ideas. Okay. Yeah.